Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, oh, yes, thank you. It's really great to have you all here for today's lecture, Salvador Dali, America's Surrealist. Um, just a reminder, uh, if you have a mobile device to turn the sound off on that, I'm actually going to double check mine right now. Good. So my name is Sam Ramos. I'm the director of gallery activation here at the Art Institute of Chicago. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Kristen French. Kristen is the tour specialist at in the Art Institute's Department of Interpretation. If you frequent the museum, you may have seen her leading a tour, or perhaps you have even joined in one of her many conversations in the galleries. I have the privilege of working closely with Kristen. She's an astounding researcher, storyteller, and educator whose insights bring a unique and often profound perspective to how people think about and connect with art. I really do learn from her all the time myself. Um, if you don't already, I'm sure you will soon know what I mean. Kristen received her BA in the history of art and architecture and her BA in public policy studies from DePaul University, where she is currently a master of education candidate in elementary education. Thank you again for being here today. And now join me in welcoming Kristen. Hello. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. You all look great, I think. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Sam, for that lovely introduction. Um, again, thank you all. I'd also like to thank the many teams who produce events like this all of the time and really keep the museum running. A lot of work goes into these lectures, making it so that I can just show up with my stack of paper, look like I've got my act together. Um, engagement, AVS, visitor services, facilities, security teams, whose work is supposed to make itself invisible, talk about the image disappearing, um, but should not be taken for granted. So thank you to all those teams. As Sam said, my work takes place in the galleries in front of the objects, um, connecting visitors to our collection. Sometimes visitors are at an art, uh, an art museum for the very first time, Sometimes I'm working with dedicated members, such as yourself, who have been coming to the Art Institute for years and decades. So a big part of my job is not just educating, but learning from our visitors, and there's a lot to learn, um, in order to have the most meaningful conversations that we can in the galleries. And one thing I have definitely learned from everyone is that people know Salvador Dali. Um, <laughs> One of the things, you know, I'm willing to bet that he might be one of the only true household names in art in the United States. Um, whether people know his biography or philosophy exactly is one thing, but people know Dali. Some know him as the guy twirling his mustache in commercials they saw as kids. Many know him as the guy with the melting clocks, but everyone knows his name. And if you didn't before this, I bet you wouldn't admit it anyway, so what does it matter? Um, this is probably why, as you might have noticed, there has been a line wrapping down the hall outside of this show every day for months. And the galleries have been completely buzzing with energy every time I've gone in, even this morning. Um, people are actively investigating these works, talking to their friends and even to strangers about what they're seeing. It's an all too rare sight in an art museum where I think people believe they're supposed to be having a silent, um, isolated experience with work uh, in the galleries. And as someone whose work revolves around gallery activation, to see the galleries so activated means something special to me. And that's part of the perspective I brought to this talk. Um, the title of today's lecture is Salvador Dali, America's Surrealist. In addition to discussing the amazing exhibition upstairs, which I hope you all have seen, you better get in there soon if not, um, titled The Image Disappears, curated by Caitlin Haskell and Jen Cohen. I'll also investigate a little bit of how we got here and what Dali offers to audiences almost a century after his work began. I know it's tacky to begin a presentation with a dictionary definition, I know this, um, but when you can find anything succinct in a piece of surrealist writing, you hold on to it for dear life. Um, so in 1924, André Breton defined surrealism with terms like psychic automatism, 
the absence of control by reason, exempt from moral concern. We also see that the dream state is very much elevated over the logical brain. Don't worry about all this text just yet, but whenever I talk about the surrealists and surrealism, I have to start with the First World War. The destruction across Europe was beyond what anyone at the time could have anticipated. Millions died, borders fell, ancient empires ended. Um, it's also extremely important to note that the First World War affected Europe very differently than it affected the United States. So surrealism is essentially born out of a particularly European reality um, that's difficult or maybe even impossible for Americans to relate to completely, not just at the time, but still today in 2023. Um, so I'll paraphrase this for time, but in 1952, Breton reflects and says at the beginning of surrealism, all of the institutions of the modern world, which had just been proved useless by the First World War, were like plagues to us. They're attacking the army, the police, the religion, the very concept of justice. And in order to do this successfully, he says, they had to attack reason and morality itself. Does this uh, sound like the kind of movement that is very interested in mainstream success? Uh-oh, how did that get there? Oh no. Um, okay, pardon my little joke there. Uh, I hope I've made some sort of point with this. Um, between Breton's first statement and 1936, which is when Dali ends up here on the cover of Time, obviously something has changed, something has happened. Um, and let's talk about how we get there. So this I included, you can see that cover up in the exhibition, um, but I added this just to demonstrate something very cool, which is if you um, go to Time's website, you can actually flip through these archived uh, editions and read uh, them in their original layout. So this is the original cover story. It's amazing, it's this compact history of Dada and surrealism, and we get these wonderful vignettes from the writer about the artists, um, and they tell us things about how Breton dresses in all green and drinks a green liqueur, and it's, it's lovely. Um, but I pulled, this, I pulled these quotes from the cover story because I think they're so illustrative of this moment in 1936. Quote, surrealism would never have attracted its present attention in the US were it not for a handsome 32-year-old Catalan with a soft voice and a clipped cinema actor's mustache, Salvador Dali. Quote, artist Dali has a faculty for publicity which should turn any circus press agent green with envy. Amazing language. And this is a tremendous amount of information for us right off the bat. Dali already has a reputation as a showman, and he's standing out particularly in the US as the face of surrealism. It never would have attracted its audience without him. I'm beginning here again to wonder what happened to the destruction of all of the rational institutions of the world. Okay. I love this picture. <laughs> I love it. Um, it's not groundbreaking scholarship to say that Dali becomes very associated with commercialism, advertising, mass media, high society later on down the line. These aren't even criticisms that are thrown against him decades after the fact. Um, they're very present during his life and active career. Um, and it's something that he also manipulates for his own benefit. We know that later on, after Dali is expelled from the Surrealists, Breton gives him the nickname Avida Dollars, um, an anagram of his name to refer to his love of cash. But this wasn't always the story. Here is a picture of the Surrealist group in 1930. I know what you're thinking, don't worry, all of the women are just out of frame. You can kind of, if you tilt your head, you can kind of see them. Um, Sorry, okay. Uh, but anyway, Dali is welcomed into the group in 1929 after impressing Breton and others with his work. He'd spent much of the 20s following the work of Picasso and experimenting with modernist styles. In the 20s, the writing of Sigmund Freud is translated um, into Spanish and Dali is totally absorbed by it. Dali joins the Surrealists at a moment of crisis although it's hard to say if the movement is ever not in crisis. Um, if you read their journals, some of it is like a soap opera. It's always in some sort of crisis. But Dali joins when the movement could really use some fresh blood and new energy, and it appears that Dali is going to help push them forward. 
So we've landed here in 1930. Um, so let's start looking at some of the works that are on view in the exhibition called The Image Disappears. The exhibition focuses on work from the 1930s and investigates the symbols and strategies that Dali uses in this pivotal decade. So here, um, we've got the fantastically titled Premature Ossification of a Railway Station. We might first notice a very early example of the melting clock point to it, <laughs> of the melting clock. Um, we've also got a lovely high-heeled shoe far off in the distance. We see Dali playing with a dramatic perspective, distorted and confusing scale, um, many things that he will repeat and continue to develop. If you are a regular visitor to the Art Institute, you might recognize this painting on the left here, which is currently on view on the third floor of the modern wing. De Chirico's The Philosopher's Conquest. What similarities and differences can we see? Most strikingly to me, the clocks. They almost mirror each other. Um, De Chirico was working in a style he called metaphysical that was very influential to the surrealists. He also played with scale, perspective, ambiguous, haunting symbols. Uh, we see that in this painting from 1913-14, in addition to some playful anatomical references uh, that will also become extremely important to Dali. De Chirico did not become the major surrealist painter as some thought he would, but it's helpful to me to think about his influence on Dali. Here also from 1930, William Tell, um, a legendary character that looms large in Dali's work, the Swiss folk hero who was forced to shoot an apple off of his son's head. Here, we don't get an illustration of that story, literally, as much as we get a symbolically charged investigation of Freud's theory of castration anxiety. Instead of a bow and arrow, the father holds a pair of scissors. Ouch. Right here. Um, <laughs> and because of a collaged fig leaf, we, can tell, we can't tell what exactly has happened or will perhaps happen. Notice here in the hands what might also be a reference to Michelangelo's creation of Adam from the Sistine Chapel. The archetype of the father as all-powerful, not just a literal father, Dali's father, um, but a political father with the power to give life and take it away is repeated often by Dali. So I won't spend too much time here, but these are wonderful, delightful objects to go see. You would never know it from this slide, but they're about this big. Um, we have matching portraits of Dali's wife, Gala, who he meets in 1929 and officially marries in 1934. To the horror of Dali's father, Gala is 10 years his senior and was previously married to Paul Eluard, another surrealist. Their lifelong relationship is intense and complicated, to say the least. Um, and here we see with the lamb chops, uh, a motif Dali will use often, where an affectionate or sexual desire is related to the desire to consume, to eat, um, which is also a destructive desire. This, uh, these portraits are based off of a photo of the couple together. And in the original photo, Dali's hand is where the lamb chops are. Uh, so that's his, his invention there. Okay, this brings us to Dali's first big contribution to surrealist theory, which is the object functioning symbolically. We have here what is essentially an object that refers to Gala um, and to sex and to food, go figure. Um, Dali is dealing with Freud's concept of the sexual fetish object. Very importantly though, uh, Dali alters surrealism's relationship to objects. Previously, surrealist objects were those that reminded an artist of a dream, something they came across by chance uh, that triggered some deja vu, directing them out of reality and back toward the irrational. So this is a big moment. Rather than merely channeling or reflecting an interior unconscious process, Dali says that surrealist art can be something created intentionally in order to bring about an effect on the viewer. Okay, this is Dali's big breakthrough, his biggest contribution to surrealist thought and practice. Uh, this 
development marks a major shift, shift for Dali's production, and it's also used to define the second gallery, the second part of the exhibition upstairs. So as a refresher, looking backward for just a moment, let's recall some of the language that's oriz originally used to define what a surrealist artwork can be. Breton describes artists turning themselves into simple receptacles, modest recording instruments, not mesmerized by the drawings we are making. These images come to him spontaneously. The will is powerless. This is strong language. The surrealist artwork at first is a record of a spontaneous, irrational, interior experience. It is not meant to mesmerize anyone. Does this sound like Dali? Okay, again, searching for a succinct definition here is a bit of a fool's errand, but in the 1930s, the early 30s, Dali starts to write about and then implement his paranoiac critical method. Here, Dali argues that the surrealist should actively systematize confusion to act against reality. He says the paranoiac critical method is an organizing force. That language of passivity falls away in favor of organized, structured images designed to produce an effect on the viewer. Now the viewer is implicated in a different way. So I'm gonna very quickly drive this point home here. Here, also on view on the third floor of the Modern Wing is a 1925 piece by the extremely prolific and influential Max Ernst. Ernst pioneered many techniques that we take for granted and was truly interested in the theory of automatism. Here we see an excellent example of a technique he called grattage, sort of a rubbing on the surface of the canvas with paint while it's imprinted against different materials. Through this process, Ernst lets the materials and his subconscious take over, and we're left with the spontaneous effects. I'm a huge fan of Max Ernst. I love this work in particular, but I'm using this to illustrate the major force of change that Dali brings to surrealism. So let's compare. On the right, we have Dali's 1938 apparition of a face and fruit dish on a beach, here with us from the Wadsworth Athenaeum. I mean, do I even have to say it? I hope you've seen this work upstairs on the right because it's so rich. And this is not a comparison of quality or thoughtfulness or skill, but it might be obvious that one of these works is meant to mesmerize the viewer. The conversations that we can have about these two works are very different. And Dali cashes in on his power to mesmerize. With the paranoiac critical method, Dali stunningly transforms surrealist theory to make way for his craftsmanship, showmanship, and to commodify his work. The situationist theorist and revolutionary Raoul Vanagam uh, is an extremely harsh critic of Dali's, but in his book on the history of surrealism, he gives Dali some credit. Vanagam says that Dali proudly commodifies his work, something that the other surrealists did only shamefacedly. This quote, which is prominent in the gallery, is very helpful in understanding what Dali wants us to do with his works. Of a cubist work, one asks, what does that represent? Of a surrealist picture, one sees what it represents but asks, what does it mean? Of a paranoiac painting, one asks abundantly, what do I see? What does that represent? What does it mean? This quote, um, it's, there's a little bit of an irony. There's an assumption that his images are enigmatic, mysterious, unstable, yet he's giving us clear instructions and directions as viewers as to how we should approach them. The next three paranoiac critical works I'm going to talk about deal most directly with themes of war. In 1936, the Spanish Civil War breaks out as reactionary fascist forces stage a coup against the left-wing Popular Front government. Nearly half a million people are killed in the war until the rebels declare victory in 1939, leading to Franco's brutal dictatorship, which lasts until his death in 1975. Dali is Spanish, he's a Catalan, and this landscape and identity loom large in his work. He wrote that around this time, the monsters of civil war had found their way onto his canvases. Here is autumnal cannibalism from 1936. There's so much to take in. Before I can even register the details, 
I noticed the color palette, very autumnal, and this amazing rendering, this softness, this fleshiness. It appears here that we have some sort of couple embraced and consuming each other. Here, we think about Dali bringing desire, love, sex, and violence into the plane of psychoanalysis with the act of consumption. Here, we see Dali taking very real, very material political events and dealing with them in the realm of aesthetics. The pair cannibalizing itself is made of the same stuff, which in some ways is apt for describing civil war. But when the world is mobilizing against fascism for the first time, is it enough to say that the principles driving all of those involved can be equated in the realm of the subconscious? Are the Republicans and the fascists really comparable and made of the same stuff just by virtue of being in conflict with each other? This is the part of the tour where I start asking those big open-ended questions that nobody wants to answer. Many of Dali's surrealist cohort have by this time already begun to worry about Dali's political alignment and perceive this type of work as one episode in his lack of clarity. Here is probably my favorite painting in the exhibition, Soft Construction with Boiled Beans, Premonition of Civil War. I'm so struck by the gruesome, disturbing expressions of this monster. The neon green, I mean, it's impossible to get it to translate on a slide, but in person, it's really stunning. The off-putting fleshiness, again, and softness of the rendering. Others have pointed out that the space created here by these monstrous appendages seem to outline the borders of Spain on a map. Dali says that this piece functioned prophetically, that he actually predicted the coming violence. He also says that he couldn't have presented such a disturbing meat to us without also including some vegetables, the beans. A well-balanced meal, according to Dali. A tiny portrait of Freud is tucked into this landscape as well. Again, Dali's version of Civil War is horrifying and violent. Two monsters of the same material ripping each other apart and at once consuming each other. I'll add again, it's impossible to tell from this slide, but there's so much detail here that you should investigate. Here's another piece that might be familiar to regular visitors. Inventions of the Monsters from 1937. This is part of our collection. While the Spanish Civil War rages on, Europe starts to anxiously consider the onset of another war. See here how when we talk about the Surrealists, we cannot get away from this political reality that specifically affects the European continent. Once again, Dali's landscape is riddled with tightly, smoothly rendered creatures we strain to make sense of. When this work was in the galleries before it was moved for the exhibition, I brought visitors on tours to it all of the time. And I would ask, would you want to venture into this landscape? I usually get a resounding no. With this piece, we see a little bit of Dali as a very prolific writer who describes a lot of his work in detail. The Art Institute acquired this painting in 1943 and Dali telegrammed the curators to congratulate them. He included a detailed description of the scene. Here we get Dali telling us exactly what's what. These monsters are symbols that mean this, this, and that. Um, and once in the galleries, after discussing this, investigating this confusing image for a long time with the group, I read them this excerpt. And I remember one person responded exasperatedly, why didn't you just start with that? You could have helped us out. And in the opening member lecture for this show, which some of you may have been at, my colleague, Dr. Oner Osterk, commented that as an art historian, it's a wonderful gift that Dali writes so much about his work. There's so much you know, that we don't have to assume, we're not left guessing. And I think that Oner is right from the art historian's perspective. Um, but from an educator's perspective, I have to strongly disagree. Because Dali loved telling us so much about himself and his work, we run the risk of, well, trusting him. And not just trusting him, but taking his word for it and calling it a day. Relying on him and his rules to bring certainty out of our confusion. Remember those questions Dali told us to ask? What does it represent? What does it mean? I think that we are certainly up to those tasks. And importantly, I also believe that we're up to a lot more. 
I don't think that we have to search for or accept some prescribed meaning. I don't think that we should always seek certainty. And I really don't think that we should take the easy way out when thinking about these works and their very complicated themes. Inventions of the Monsters is also a really excellent example of one of Dali's strategies with disappearing images. In his description, he says, the little blue dog is not a true monster. Where the hell is the little blue dog? Okay. Um, it's hard to see even in, the, even in the galleries up close, but maybe you can make out this glow here. Our curators and conservatives examined this work closely to determine if the vanishing of this image was the result of fading pigments, but they discovered this was not the case. The little blue dog is disappearing on purpose um, and is perhaps a veiled reference to Dali's friend, the poet Federico Garcia Lorca, who was killed by nationalist forces at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War. Here is another wonderful disappearing image. The chemist lifting with extreme precaution the cuticle of a grand piano from 1936. A barren landscape, a chemist, a child, a woman with flowers for a head. Here we see the composer Wagner with the green hat and a reclining figure who Dali describes as a combination of the artist himself, the artist's father, and Lenin. The surface is cracked except for one area where it appears there's something smooth beneath the paint. Our curators and conservators were also wondering, is this intentional? Is this a recycled canvas? What is going on underneath? An amazing discovery. Um, discernible under the surface is a portrait of Ludwig II of Bavaria. Here. Um, the photo on the right, I actually took myself during a visit to conservation last winter, which is just as cool as it sounds. Um, and yes, I'm rubbing it in. And I managed to get a really good lighting angle on this phantom form here, which I think makes it a little bit easier to see. I wasn't sure what to make of this story, this connection, when I first learned about it. But if there's one thing Dolly's good for, it's constructing these webs of characters for us to connect and consider. I loved learning about Ludwig II, who, in addition to being this tragic, romantic figure of sorts, was a major fan and patron of Wagner. I read more about their relationship, and I found a quote attributed to Wagner about meeting Ludwig for the first time. Alas, he is so handsome and wise, soulful and lovely, that I fear his life must melt away in this vulgar world like a fleeting dream of the gods. We have to raise our standards. If your man is not talking about you like this, <laughs> get rid of him. Life is too short. Um, but here, Dali really does melt away Ludwig like a dream. I'm going to quickly move through the next few slides, which bring us the title of the exhibition, The Image Disappears. Here we get to see some of Dali's very deliberate processes. This is obviously a picture that I unprofessionally took of something in a glass case. Um, and this careful planning designed to organize paranoia, again, as a far cry from the spontaneous works of early surrealism. These three works are shown in the exhibition together for the first time ever, and because of the delicacy of drawing on paper, likely also the last time. We can see Dali's process of carefully balancing two different images to create the completed image in the center. The ink drawing furthest to the right, you may recognize from our Bergman collection, but the other two are traveling. As we can tell, Dali is always referring to something, a legend, a Freudian concept, a historical figure, and particularly to other artists who are influential to him. We can see here Dali's The Image Disappears in the center, flanked by Vermeer's Woman in Blue reading a letter as well as by a self-portrait of Diego Velasquez, who was infinitely important to Dali. And get a load of that mustache. Yeah. I'll also point out that behind Dali's woman is a map of Spain. You can see that there. Uh, now we're gonna move on to 1939. This year, Dali is finally completely expelled from the Surrealist group um, for work that is increasingly politically intolerable to Breton and other Surrealists. Um, Additionally, he is fully committed to commercializing his work. These things are unforgivable to the remaining surrealists, 
Um, and as the curators helpfully write in the exhibition text, he has officially become a surrealist movement of one in the US. Dali collaborates with print media, fashion designers often. In 1939, he begins working more on the construction of entire environments, immersive environments, including a storefront for the retail Bonwit Teller. I was amazed by this excerpt from Time Magazine again. Bonwit Teller has earned a reputation for having Manhattan's screwiest window displays. A fortnight ago, Bonwit smartly hired the world's number one surrealist, Salvador Dali, to create two more screwy windows. World's number one surrealist, Andre Breton, eat your heart out. Here we also have an ad from an earlier collaboration that illustrates how Dali's brand of images actually become immersive and even wearable. So this is a big change as well. Okay. The dream of Venus Pavilion at the 1939 World's Fair, an amazing, huge, immersive experience. Dali moves here to bring his surrealist brand to more popular audiences, and he succeeds. It's a bit of a surrealist funhouse. There are performers dressed as mermaids, his lovely liquid ladies, a wet room and a dry room, no surface left uncovered by Dali's touch. He flees the United States before opening the fair out of frustration with who he calls the fair's bureaucrats who limit his creative vision. And I think bureaucrat is one of the all time best insults. Um, in preparation for this exhibition, the curators considered a Dali work that's been very popular in the Art Institute's collection for some time. You've probably seen it. Um, it was originally dated from 1936 and given the title Visions of Eternity. But based on the close study of the technique of Dali's other 1936 works, they just didn't feel that this identification was correct. Something amazing about working in museums is dealing with the long and complicated lives of the objects before they make it into the galleries. I love imagining these teams standing in front of this painting, wondering for a moment, where the hell did this thing come from? And then they figure it out. Intensive study by Jen Cohen, curator of provenance and research, led to the discovery that this panel was actually created in 1939, not 1936. And instead of being created as a standalone painting, it was created for the Dream of Venus Pavilion as part of a wall mural. We can see it on the previous slide here. Tucked away. Um, you might also be able to recognize the rest of these panels as other very famous works by Dali, which are now located at museums in Japan. Um, the work in our collection is being displayed for the first time with its new correct identification, which is very cool. So this here is where I reach the end of what's presented in the exhibition. The image disappears, focuses on the works from the 30s, but Dali's uh, story in the United States doesn't end quite yet. So in 1939, Dali has succeeded in delivering his surrealist movement of one to the mainstream United States. He's certainly become America's surrealist. How? Why? Maybe because he's the only one who wants to. Isn't American popular consumer culture the graveyard of any intellectual avant-garde? Or maybe plenty of them want to be in his position, but he's the best salesman. The 40s mark a different phase in his career. He and Gala return to the US when France is invaded. They swiftly calculate that the best way to make a living is to turn toward high society patrons who stand to benefit just as much from him in the way of perceived cultural enlightenment as he stands to gain from them in the way of cold hard cash and publicity. The philosophical and political intricacies that plagued the surrealist movement in Europe are simply of no use to Dali's American patrons and of no use to Dali either. Dali's immersive constructions for fashion and for huge parties like the surrealistic night in an enchanted forest are officially fodder for society pages. Here in the Monterey Peninsula Herald, we read that Mrs. Morse, the wife of a developer of Pebble Beach says, you couldn't pay me to stay away from this party. 
Uh, here, I have very much condensed a timeline of Dali in the US in the 40s to illustrate some general trends of his career. Much of the writing about his own work that we have uh, today comes from his bombshell autobiography published in 1942. It's rife with exaggeration, self-aggrandizement, some outright lies, and plenty of explanation of his work and intentions. It's a total hit. Uh, George Orwell, who actually did go to fight against the fascists in Spain, reviewed the book. He said, it, quote, it is a book that stinks. <laughs> <laughs> if it were possible for a book to give a physical stink off its pages, this one would. A thought that might please Dali. But the book helps to solidify Dali's own mythology and caricature. He spends the rest of the 40s selling his society portraits and collaborating with big names like Hitchcock and even Walt Disney. He becomes enamored with the atomic age after the bombs are dropped in Japan, and the content of his work strays further from surrealism. He and Gala <laughs> return to Spain in 1948. The remaining decades of his life are marked by increasing involvement in advertising as a sort of mascot for the fantastic. His work is extremely influential to future generations of artists, experimenting with conceptual sculpture, probing the subconscious, and investigating the function of mass media and advertising. But Dali has no harsher critics than his former surrealist comrades in the battle against the oppressive structures of the modern world. I'll return here to these questions Dali encourages us to ask. When the Surrealists were first starting out, they were known for playing games, which is a subject for a different lecture. But at these big, raucous parties, these friends, lovers, and revolutionaries would play games intended to move them beyond rationality, beyond the confines of their world in rubble, toward spontaneity, where they thought they might be able to catch a glimpse of the possibility of the better world. What a wonderful project. And I think about the liveliness of our galleries that I mentioned at the start. Rooms full of people eager to share their discoveries with each other. Dali's work is obviously mesmerizing. If we only answer the questions that Dali poses, I think we limit what's possible. So allow me to conclude by posing my own question. What do I see? What does it represent? And what are we gonna do about it together? Thank you. So I have time for questions. Um, raise your hand if you have a question and someone will find you with a microphone. I'm curious about one of the paintings that you are not including in, uh, in this uh, piece here um, that's in the exhibit and, and held by the Art Institute, uh, May West Face, which can be used as a surrealist apartment. Mm -hmm. um, that was 34 or so, 35. Um, but she was such a big part of American culture at that point. Um, do you think that that had a connection to how he became more popular here? Absolutely, yeah. And what's being referred to is a work um, where Dali takes basically a film photo, a film poster of a movie star, Mae West, and he turns her face into a surrealist apartment. So it's this really playful double image using the very recognizable face of an American celebrity. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that this, you know, he's very carefully considering what figures he wants to talk about, bring into his work. Um, and the Mae West face as an apartment cashes in on how recognizable she is. And he goes on to develop a line of furniture actually based on the, the apartment furniture uh, that he paints. So you can actually buy Mae West's lips as a surrealist couch. So this is very, definitely very strategic. 
Um, and there's a long legacy of this. I mean, if we even want to connect it to Andy Warhol, like what is the purpose of very specifically using women's celebrities' bodies um, to, as the group? Excuse me, as the groundwork for your commentary. Yeah. Anybody else? We have one oh, in the back. One over here. How's it going? Great job, by the way. No, oh, thank Very you. Thanks. Um, two questions. Would you be able to elaborate on some of the games that they played? Um, you know, to get their brain going and you know to get the creativity flowing. Mm -hmm. And then I had one question about the exhibit. Um, there was one piece in there that talks about, it wasn't a piece, it was actually a book. Um, it was the Declaration of Independence of the Imagination of the Right of Man, which is on madness. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little about that. Sure. Um, you know, again, the Surrealist Games is really fodder for its own huge amount of conversation. Probably one of the most famous and one that I am endeared to is called Exquisite Corpse. It's a drawing game. Um, basically, a piece of paper is folded up into quadrants, and you can't see what the person in front of you drew, but it's a collaborative, randomized game where someone draws one portion, it's passed along, someone draws another portion, and then at the end you get a lovely communal creation. Um, but games like, you know, drawing games, but also um, stream of consciousness writing and speaking games uh, where you try to break down your own boundaries in a group of people. Um, but there are lovely books of surrealist games and they go on and on and on. So I welcome you all to dive into that if it's interesting to you. Your second question about the declaration of the rights of the artist to his own madness. I'm paraphrasing the title there is a pamphlet that Dali writes actually in reaction to what he thinks is the censorship, he calls the bureaucracy of the people running the 1939 World's Fair. So he really, his dream is on the outside of the pavilion to have a mermaid who instead of having the top half of a female torso and the tail of a fish, he wants to display the inversion of that with a woman's body and the head of a fish. And they say, this is, for some reason, this is where they draw the line with him. <laughs> uh, you know, of all places, this is where they draw the line with him. Um, and he has enough, so he wants to declare his right to his independence. And so actually kind of the, the mural outside of the galleries, our curators have made the decision to give him his mermaid finally. So you can see that added to our show. I hope that addresses your question. Anything else? Yes, there's one right here. Uh, looking at large at Dolly's um, work, I was just looking through one of the books and it seems like in, in 1920, roughly, there, there's a huge shift in his uh, style, um, you know, kind of finding his own identity as an artist and whatnot is, is I mean, you, you kind of mentioned that uh, Freud could have been a, an example of something that might have triggered him or uh, World War I. Could you just I don't know, elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in 1920, he's 16 years old, so he's still a, a young art student. And what's very fashionable at the time is cubism and uh, other styles that Picasso is pushing forward. So as a very young person who's very interested in the avant-garde, that is who he's really captivated by, so he makes a lot of work in those styles. Um, but he remains on the cutting edge, and the cutting edge changes. Um, after the First World War, there's sort of split responses artistically. Surrealism is an example of people looking at this destruction and wanting to push the boundaries even further. There's also, from some artists, a desire to what's called return to order, return to classicism. 
So Dali is kind of touched a little bit by both of these currents. He's interested in old masters, right, like Velasquez, um, but he also is very, very influenced by Freud. So I would point to Freud and de Chirico probably as being two of the major forces that push him in that direction. Any other questions? I've always been fascinated by his perspective, like for Christ of St. John on the Cross or, or these, these angles that he put on, puts in his paintings, in, including the photographic feel of them. Um, has he ever talked about where he comes up with these ideas that create these perspectives that are so amazing? Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, Christ of St. John is later on when he's very much delving into religious iconography. And if you all want to look it up, there is kind of this very dramatic downward perspective. The writing that we do have from this period about where he gets his ideas, again, he does tell us about it, but we should take it with a bit of a grain of salt. He tells us that he sees things prophetically, that he's overcome by these waves of mania and paranoia. He really leans into this, am I a madman? Am I not a madman? What does that mean in you know, 1930s Paris when paranoia is all the rage as a theory? Um, he would like us to believe that it just comes to him in these visions and we can accept that or we can accept that he's a very, very talented draftsman um, and extremely creative and extremely skilled. So if we take his word for it, it's some fantastical inspiration, essentially. So we can, we can take that or complicate it a little bit, if that's helpful. Any, any last questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>